A precious, a precious child of God yesterday chose to take his vehicle and make it into a weapon and plowed it in to a crowd of peaceful folks on the sidewalk killing one in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I spent four years of my life as a UVA student. This act of what I can only call domestic terrorism happened in the face of a hate group, several hate groups that gathered in Charlottesville to protest. And uh, into such a world, Jesus was born. Into such a world, God said, I can't stay out of the fray. I must become one of them. I must join with them and show them, first of all, that human agency matters. That what we do matters, what we say matters, when we love matters, how we live matters. No excuses for being only human because it's not that we're only human. We are amazingly human. If God didn't like human beings, God would never have made them to begin with. Uh, and so it is that uh, while I'm reading from Luke 2, I think it's interesting. I came across this passage as I was looking just before Luke 2 and Luke 1. Uh, Zechariah prophesies and he said, Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide us on the path of peace. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. The first enrollment occurred when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and family line, he went up to, from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage and who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the guest room. Nearby shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angels stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring you good news, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth. Peace among those whom God favors. Peace among those whom God favors. You know, I had a wonderful plan for a sermon this week. Uh, you know, I always think it's a wonderful plan when I start to plan it because, of course, don't we all think our plans are wonderful? Uh, and I had a wonderful plan about stepping out in faith and Matthew 14, through 33, began reading that and spent the week about Peter stepping out of the boat in faith, taking the risk that faith entails. And if you think about it, this story is that story, only the first forward step, and it's on God's behalf. God had faith enough in us to take the risk to become one of us, to take the risk of all that it could be to be human. God had faith in us. Randy told us that just a couple of weeks ago. God had faith in us. And so in Bethlehem, a long time ago, a baby was born. And the angels proclaimed and the heavenly hosts at his birth that indeed, that there would be peace on earth. 
Now, you know, I don't have to look very far day by day in the news to find the lack of peace in our world. There is still hunger, despite the fact there's no shortage of food in the world. There are still people living on the streets, though there is no shortage of shelter. And there is still violence in all sorts of places everywhere, all the time. The funny thing, not so funny a thing to me, is that yesterday I was invited by several of my clergy friends who went to be part of the peaceful protest um, to go to Charlottesville. But instead I stayed to play with the tech system in the back so we could have better streaming quality because I didn't realize how important it might have been for me to be in Charlottesville yesterday. Um, And intriguingly enough, the clergy locked arms, uh, the pastors locked arm in arm uh, over against militia armed with automatic weapons, uh, not automatic weapons, excuse me, uh, assault rifles. Uh, It looks like automatic weapons to me. I know the difference. Um, uh, As a protest that was all about hate took place. And that was what it was all about. Hate. Hate. Now see, we live in a world where it is becoming, again, popular to hate. It's okay to hate. It's okay to be hateful in public. Um, It's okay to be hateful on Twitter. It's okay to be hateful on Facebook. It's okay to be hateful all sorts of places. It's okay to be hateful with your car and run somebody over, including killing somebody. And I'm sorry, but that's not okay with God. It is simply not okay. Hate is not okay. I don't care what anybody else tells you about that. There is a certain amount of freedom of speech, and everybody ought to be able to say what they think. But you ought to be careful about what that is. Be careful about what that is. Now, what ultimately led me to celebrate Christmas and God's birth amidst us is he, God, Jesus, Christ in the person of Jesus, was born in an exceptionally violent time. We have domesticated this wonderful symbol, and we use it for all sorts of intriguing things, and it's been used for bad as well as good, but in the time of Jesus, it was meant to intimidate everyone who saw it. If our village here on the west end of Alexandria rebelled against the Romans, what would happen to us is they would crucify us along the side of the road to remind us. Every 40 feet or so, there there have been times when they were as, as close together as every 40 feet or so along a long road to remind people not to stand up because this is what happens when you stand up against the powers that be. We have to stand up, and God had to take a stand, and God became one of us to take a stand for love. Now, what's interesting to me is I found this song played in my head. Isn't that the way it works for all of us? Or maybe not for all of us, but for me, it plays in my head. It's a a song that is originally was written um, in the 1800s. It was written as a poem. At a time in 1863, Henry uh, Wadsworth Longfellow wrote this poem. I think you will recognize the words that were later set to a tune. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. In music sweet, the tones repeat, there's peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor does he sleep, for Christ is here, his spirit near brings peace on earth, goodwill to men. When men repent and turn from sin, it goes on. Uh, The words to this song that I've heard sung many times when I was growing up. 
Uh, it's not in the hymnal. I just couldn't even believe it. I pulled out the United Methodist hymnal and looked for it. Psh, not even in there. But we live in a time where hate is running rampant. And it seems that it is indeed strong. Which means love must be the stronger. It means you and I cannot sit back while we listen to vitriol and hate spewed by a variety of people. We cannot sit back. When we stand around the water cooler at work and someone spews hate, we must speak up then. Because it is that hate that turns into violence against our sisters and, pr and brothers of color, our sisters and brothers who are immigrants, our sisters and brothers who are different, who look different, who are different than we are, and thank God for them. That is never and will never be acceptable in the kingdom of God. Love is all, that, that's the only language we can speak. Love at every twist and every turn, at every corner, that is the only language of the church. Judgment is not the language of the church. And I realize I speak the love, the, the words of, I've already called it domestic terrorism. I don't know why everybody else hasn't called it domestic terrorism. When you take a car and ram it into a group of people, that's terrorism. Isn't that what we call the plane that ran into a building in New York? Just because the person who did it was born here doesn't make it any less terroristic. And we've got to start calling it what it is. Hate is hate, and it has no place. You know, I don't often quote politicians, but I was so thankful when our governor said, go home. Go home. Leave. Leave Virginia. We don't need hate gathered here. We don't need it here. Get out. Bye. Don't let the door hit you on the bottom. I, I can't believe what I see sometimes. And it's on the rise, and it seems to be popular. Now, whatever you think about the removal of a Confederate monument in the middle of Charlottesville, which is what was voted on democratically in the city of Charlottesville, you can come and peacefully protest. I'm not sure why you would peacefully protest while bringing assault rifles with you. That, doesn't, that seems contrary to peace to me, but... Apparently, I don't understand peace. Um, but the truth is, we are living in a dark time, my friends. Now, I'm not saying it hasn't been dark for 2,000 years in a variety of ways. But we have to be a different kind of voice. And not a shouting voice like I just was. I am so angry at the core of my being. I am so angry at the core of my being that this is what we have fallen to. There's no room for racism in America. There is no room for sexism in America. There is no room for any ism in America. There is only room for love. And certainly, if, if we are going to be followers of Jesus, love must be the only word from our mouths. You notice when I told the story, and this was hard for me when I told the story at the beginning of my sermon, to say a precious child of God chose to use his car against other children of God. When we pray today, when it comes time for us to pray, we're going to pray for that man. I don't know his name. Please don't say it out loud. <laughs> oh, you can say it out loud if you want to. I can't remember what his name is. I read it enough times, but I can't. We're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for his family. We're going to pray for everyone from his organization. Because anyone that thinks it's okay to hate a person who's not white, God needs to work in their heart. There needs to be transformation. Any person who thinks that whoever they are is the head of the game. I read a story yesterday that started off about radicalized men gathering to do some violence, and I was sure we were talking about the Islamic State. <laughs> no, it was white guys in Charlottesville. <laughs> and
and it's not okay. So, what can we do? What can we do? Well, you know, I do think that our agnostic and atheistic sisters and brothers, and some of our Christian sisters and brothers who call us out and say, you know, every time something like this happens, you all call for some more prayer. <laughs> Maybe you ought to do something now. <laughs> Instead of, you know, praying is a nice thing. I like that whole prayer thing. It works. I do it every day. It changes who I am. But I need to do something else too, and maybe it involves being a little bit like God was in, in stepping out in faith and being born among us. It means risking not being liked all the time. You know, one of the cores of who I am, my wife would tell you, is I like to be liked. I like we all do like, you know, affection. You know, I, I love affection. I like it when you, I would love to have talked to you about stepping out in faith today and, you know, you know, Peter on the water. It would have been really cool. And then Charlottesville happened. And I had two choices this morning. As I sat in my chair, I had this wonderfully formed sermon or I could start from scratch. So at 5.30 this morning, God and I started from scratch because I could not let stand what tore at me all day yesterday. So what can you do? Well, when you hear somebody else say something hateful, even if they're saying it offhand or just in a cutesy fashion, you know, you can say something about that. That doesn't mean they're going to take it well or they're going to like you yesterday. I was here at church doing some work. You know, the kids had left. We had this wonderful vacation Bible school experience yesterday, one day vacation Bible school. And we had white children and brown children and we had black children all here having a great time together like God intended the kingdom to be. And somebody pulled up in front of the church because you know, this is a big parking. This is a long parking road all along here. But when this person pulled up in front, they were like four feet in front of this, of, of our driveway to the back of the church. And I'm like, you know. So I go out to say something. I wasn't, I don't even think I had an ugly look on my face, but he jumped out of the vehicle and said, now, I'm not leaving it here. And he just went off. It was first response. It was like, dude, <laughs> I just was going to ask you not, we have yet to have a person towed. And believe me, every other day I could have a person towed who was blocking the driveway because it's against the law. Every other day I could have somebody towed, but a lot of them are students going across the street and if they can't afford a parking permit, they're not going to be able to afford to pay the, you know, the parking fine either. I write them a nice note and it's always a nice note and I leave it on their front windshield. So I just wanted to catch him before he parked it there. Because yesterday I was in the kind of mood that was developing as I watched the news develop and as I worked in the sanctuary where I might have called parking enforcement and had him towed. <laughs> Just because I could. Uh, because I get tired of it. So, I mean, he yelled at me. I said, I just was going to ask you to make sure I'm not going to do it. So, we're, you know, he was moving one car, because this is his parking storage facility. So, uh, he was moving one car and moved his other car into that place. And then, you know, and then as he was coming back, I just said, I need you to know something. I'm sorry if you misunderstood what I was saying to you. I just didn't want you to park in front. I said, every day, or, or often, every other day, there is a student or someone parked in front of the driveway. And I just didn't want that to happen when we have worship here tomorrow. And he said, I'm sorry I responded the way that I did. You didn't know what I was doing, so how could you have known? And in the end, we walked away. He didn't stab me, I didn't stab him. <laughs> you know, um, he was clearly defensive. I could have become offensive. I was a white guy, he was a black guy. Who knows what was going on in his mind about the white guys inserting his power? I don't know. I'll never know, because I don't think I'll have the conversation with him again. 
if I see him again, I'm going to hide in the church building, just peek out the door until he's gone. Unless he parks in front of my driveway, then I'll have him towed away. No. <laughs> see? See? We live, we, we live in a world where it's too easy to make assumptions about each other. And quite frankly, I think, you know, Linda was in the worship center watching me out there, and she was like, because she was walking up where she saw the guy parking there, and she didn't say anything, but I said something. So she's inside in here doing some other stuff. And when I walk right back outside the door, she was like, I'm sure she's thinking, what the heck are you getting ready to do? Are you going to go out and have... I know I was going to go apologize. You know, I wanted to set the air straight. I wasn't trying to set you off. Sorry, whatever's going on in your day. But maybe every once in a while, recognizing that maybe the other person doesn't see it your way is a, is a possibility. You know, I know that you all, if you were really right, would see everything exactly as I see it. But you're not all really right. So you have to be, I have to tolerate you being a little wrong. <laughs> Because I know I'm right. Isn't really that the way we approach every conversation? I'm really right and you're really wrong, but we can have this conversation until maybe every once in a while entering a conversation saying, you know what, I may not be right this time. I may be wrong. Lord knows, I've preached in this same congregation. It's not the same because it's constantly changing, but for 20, over 25 years now. And I would like to tell you that every sermon that I preached was perfect. <laughs> and exactly on target. I would love to tell you that. I would love to tell you that. But you all have heard me. I've had people come to me and say, James, are you sure that was like in the Bible? Did you just make that up? I don't think God really said that, James. Yeah, I'm not always right. But neither are you. And neither is the other person. And if we could just learn to make a little bit of room for each other. Now, you can't make room for somebody who's spewing hate. I, I, I think you have to respond with love at its best. You know, and you can start with I statements. I don't see it the same way. I think God loves everybody. Not just white people. Or not just non-Jews. Or not just whoever. Um... You can respond with a statement about where you stand. And do it in person. Don't wait and send them an email later on. That's never helpful. <laughs> Emails just stir up stuff. So, what can you do? You can be love in your workplace. You can be love when you shop. You can do the little things. Like, even if you think you're right, <laughs> like I did yesterday afternoon, you can, in all honesty, open your hands, walk out, and say, I'm sorry. You must have heard me the wrong way. I just didn't want the driveway blocked. And the guy was, it changed the tone. It took it down a notch. Everything doesn't have to be crank it up another notch. So maybe when you feel yourself cranking it up another notch, do this. Do this. Do this. Oh, no. Families are good, fair game. Boom! <laughs> you bring down the boom, baby. Josh, you are five minutes past your curfew, you boy. Give me those car keys. I don't care if you're 21 or not. This is my house. All right, no, we don't bring the hammer down on Joshua anymore. Then Hannah would say we never have brought the hammer down on Joshua. That's Hannah's my daughter. Joshua's my son. The truth is, this is a volatile world. It's probably always been a volatile world. We just know more about the volatility of what's going on around us all the time by all the different pieces. You and I have a choice every moment of every day how we respond to what happens in front of us. And when we see something wrong, we can say something. We can do something. And we can make sure that people know where we stand. But I will tell you that St. James, as long as I'm the pastor here, which could be to end tomorrow, I guess, you know, 
But as long as we're here, we stand for love. We stand for love in the face of hate and all other kinds of violence. We stand for love. And I hope we can all stand for love together. God left us on the west end of Alexandria for a reason. I don't know what exactly it is, clearly, but we're going to be love on the west end. Maybe that's our new motto. I don't know. We'll see. Love on the west end. But All right, well, it's time to pray. And obviously, you've probably been sitting there praying the whole time. Boy, that guy has wound up. I hope he doesn't have a heart attack while he's preaching. <laughs> Charlottesville holds a special place in my heart, and that uh, drove some things home. So, But people hold a special place in my heart, too. So I would like to pray for the young woman, just 32 years old, who died at the hands of this a young man. I'd like to pray for uh, the two state troopers who were part of the, um, they were in a helicopter, part of the oversight of, you know, to help protect people and, you know, oversee, and then they, the helicopter crashed. No one else was hurt, but they were both killed. And so I want us to pray for those state troopers, um, families. And um, I want to pray for this prevalence of, of this, this growing popularity to hate, it just seems more popular today to hate. When I was growing up, it was unpopular to hate. So um, I just want us to uh, pray for our leaders, uh, for their wisdom. Uh, I, I want to pray for all of our first responders because they're the ones that rush in. When everybody else is rushing out, they are there. You know, I, I read an article last night that was critical of the police response. I mean, what do you suppose? Charlotte's was a little tiny town. <laughs> you know, we don't have a lot of people show up and, you know, I think they did their best. That's all they can do. Uh, so I want to pray for our first responders. I want to pray for all of those who uh, every day face challenges. Guess what? That makes every single one of us part of that prayer. And I want us to pray that we'll have the courage to respond differently than maybe our first inkling is. Because sometimes, boy, the other day when I crushed the curry with my left hand because it made, my right hand because it made me angry when it wanted me to clean the needle for the fourth time in a row, bam, my daughter was like, Dad, what the heck is going on? And Curry is evil, possessed by the devil. <laughs> I was beating him back. <laughs> I don't think I said that, but I don't know. I thought that at that moment. We don't have to respond the way that, because uh, that's not a response, it's a reaction. Um, I want us to pray for healing in our communities. That's probably enough. Uh, to pray about in this moment. I, I want to give thanks, though, for the adults that were a part of yesterday's um, Children's Vacation Bible School. That was going to be my high point to lead with today. Vacation Bible School! You can see a picture on the printed update, and we'll be print, posting some pictures other places. But uh, what a great time was had by all. So, we will... Uh, We'll begin in a moment of silent prayer, and I, I encourage you to just let your heart rest in the Lord in that silent moment. I'll pray out loud for us, and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. There'll be a version on the screen behind me, but you pray any version you want to pray, or the one that's on the screen, or no, no version at all. But that's how we'll end our time is the Lord's Prayer. Let's go into God in a moment of silence.
Gracious and loving God, your goodness permeates all that is. Now, we have to admit that sometimes it's just really hard to see. You, that, that heavenly host that proclaimed peace on earth, goodwill to us, uh, it, it looks like it didn't catch on very good. Uh, we, we look around and wonder a little bit, maybe more than a little bit, about the way that we are quick to hate and quick to, uh, quick to respond in anger and ugliness to one another rather than offer a hand of friendship and hope. We want to be different than that. In fact, we are certain that is the call of Jesus. Not to draw lines, but instead to include, to open our arms and to welcome one another. Even those who say the most vile things we hate are loved by you. We pray for the young man from Ohio who got in his car and used it as a tool of destruction. And in the process killed a young woman and injured a number of others. We pray for him and his family. We pray that they would find healing and hope and transformation in you. You can even turn hate into love. And we pray that that kind of transformation will happen for that young man. We pray that all hate will be transformed to love, and we know that the only way to do it is for us to break the chain of violence and anger and hate. We have to be love. When we are hated, we have to respond in love. You taught us to turn the other cheek, to walk the extra mile. You taught us to go further than expected. We know what society expects. You hit me, I hit you back. But you expect something different. You expect for us to love back, and that's hard. That's, that's hard. This whole business of following you, this is just messy and challenging and complex, and we could wish for a greater ease, but that's not happening. Life is just this way. But what we know is that you are always with us. In the face of every challenge, you are here. And we pray that we would just let the love ooze out of us, sometimes spew out of us in positivity, that you would have us stand in and stand in the way of hate. Help us to learn the way of Jesus. Help us to truly not just believe in his message, but live his message. And trust that what he's calling us to be, he told us the greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And when asked to define the neighbor, he chose the most heinous choice he could choose for his Jewish audience, a Samaritan. I suspect today he would choose the most heinous choice for any one of us in this room. Because love of the neighbor is for all. Help us, O oh God, to be the love of neighbor here at St. James and in our communities and in our workplaces and our shopping places and wherever we find ourselves. Help us to love and to hope and to believe and to continue to persevere because your message the kingdom of God in the midst of us, all around us, if we only open our eyes, could truly transform this world. It is radical. And it's what you call us to. Thanks, God. Thanks for all the leaders who were part of yesterday's Vacation Bible School, for the children who came and shared, for our first responders, We pray for them and for those who are on the front lines all over the world. We pray for peace in our world, really peace. We believe you had faith enough in us to believe it. You proclaimed it at the birth of your son in our midst. Help us to be more like him.
We ask it in the precious and holy name of your son, Jesus, whose birth we celebrate every day, but this day in August as well, and who taught us when he grew up a prayer that we...